Muhammad. Bar Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Salwa. This is a Marcia in which we are reminded that Imam Hussein gave his head and that we don't forget why he did what he did. Kyunkar Juda Hua Sare Kyunkar Juda Hua Sare Sarvar Na Bhool Na Gamusha Hedi Ka Muzhtar na bhool na Kyun kar juda hua sare Jaldi bulana kehti thi Subhara pidar se ye Jaldi Pulana Kehti Thi Subhara Pidar Se Ye Hale Mariz Ae Mere Sarwar Na Bhool Na Alhamdulillah, Hadana 
هذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله لقد جاءت رسول ربنا بالحق والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين أبي القاسم محمد Subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that those who believe seek assistance through patience and prayers. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with those who are patient. Tonight is an important night for several reasons. One, of course, is that it is the Shahadat night of really the first martyr of Karbala. We should not forget Muslim Ibn Aqil because he was with Imam Hussain alayhi salam and Imam had dispatched him as an ambassador to go and represent him in Kufa. And he went with a lot of enthusiasm. And the way he was received by the people of Kufa as he enters the city convinced him that the people of Kufa really want Imam Hussain to come to Kufa. But then he and inshallah in the holy, I mean, in the month of Muharram, as we commemorate this year, I will talk more about the contribution of the Shias of Kufa, as well as the history of Kufa, who was the founder of Kufa, <coughs> and what really transpired that changed the events and the people of Kufa. It's very important for us to understand that because there are people today in the world saying that after all the people who killed Imam Hussein for which he was killed were the Shias. They're the ones who asked him to come. We didn't. So the responsibility goes to the Shia community. But we want to talk about that in this month of Muharram. Why? What happened to those people? Who were those people? And it is an amazing part of history. 
that tells us what transpired and who were the people who were responsible for asking Imam to come there. And then eventually he gets directed into Karbala. And what transpired, inshallah, we will talk about that. <coughs> but tonight, I want to emphasize on one thing, and that is that the single most important day in the calendar of the Muslims is the day of Arafah. There is no bigger day than this day of Arafah. And unfortunately, the importance is not given because it is, and we are very fortunate that this year it is a Sunday, and we have that day of Arafah because the day of Arafah is the first day of Hajj. Therefore, it is important why we need to commemorate this day, particularly the amals of tomorrow, and why they are so important for us. For those of us particularly who live in the Western Hemisphere today, and why it is important for us. <coughs> but when you look at <coughs> the word Arafah, comes from the word Araba. It is said that when Hazrat Adam committed the mistake that he made by eating the apple that he was not supposed to eat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala separated Janabi Hawa and Janabi Hazrat Adam for 40 years. That was one of the penalty Adam paid for it. They were both separated. Today, the, unfortunately, when we go to Saudi Arabia, we don't go to the cover of Janabi Hawa. Jiddah is known as Jiddah because of Jadda, because of the grandmother, because that is where she is buried. And that's why the city of Jadda is known as Jadda. But when we are in <coughs> Arafat, I don't know how many of you have been, I know, brother, you went last year, so you probably have a lot of memory of what transpired in, in Mecca and Medina. But how many of you have been to uh, Hajj? Mashallah. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those of you who have been there that may Allah give us all an opportunity to go for Hajj. And I pray to Allah that those who have not been there that may Allah inspire them to be able to go for Hajj inshallah next time. One of the things that we are told that if you ever have that desire of Hajj and you want to plan Hajj for next year or the year after, then recite Surah Namal more often. Because by reciting Surah Namal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the opportunity to a person who wants to go for Hajj. So keep that in mind. But when it comes to Arabah, when Hawa and Adam were brought together, they were brought together on the mountain of Arafat. Today, if you go there, you will find thousands and millions of people going up and down that mountain. And they also are scattered all over the land of Arafat and Mina. And it is an absolutely amazing sight to see. But here is where these two people came together. And they came to recognize each other. To know each other back is known as Arafat. Arafat means forgiveness also. But the main thing is this. 
And when Jibreel Aminare came to Hazrat Ibrahim and was explaining him the event of Hajj, Ibrahim said, Arafta. And he said, I understand that. I recognize that that's what I have to do. Therefore, the name of Arafat came into existence. And Arafat is a very important time, my brothers and sisters. There are three very important amals that you do tomorrow. Number one is that you do ghusl tomorrow. In the morning, anytime, before you come to the center. Or if you take a shower early in the morning during a Fajr prayer or before Fajr. But do a ghusl. Now, the, the interesting thing about the ghusl of Arafat is that you can stand before you start your ghusl under the shower as you are ready to start to do the ghusl. Make as many niyats, as many intentions that you want. You can say that, Ya Allah, I am doing this ghusl for the protection of my 12th Imam. You can say that I am doing this ghusl for the protection of our scholars. You can say I am doing this ghusl for the unity of Muslims. All of these things, you can say that and say as many intentions as you have, including your own reasons. If you are sick or if you know of someone who is sick, all of those intentions you can make before you do that one whistle in the morning. You can have as many intentions as you want, but only one time is when you will do your ghusl. After you've done the ghusl, the second thing that is very important that we will perform tomorrow afternoon is the two two rakat namaz. Now I'm giving you the most important component of this, num this particular amaz. If you are to look at Mafatiul Jinan and Abbas Kumi, they've written quite a bit of amals that are not only performed on the day but also on the eve of Arafat all the way into the morning. But for the two hours that we have tomorrow, the important amal is that you do two two rakat namaz just like as if you are doing namaz e subh. And in that you are reciting Surah Al-Hamd and 50 times Surah Kul Allahu Ahad in each rakat. That means by the time you're finished two and two, you have recited 200 times Surah Kul Allahu Ahad. Now, of course, there are people who cannot do that because of age, because of various reasons they are not. Well, they're exempted. They can do smaller version and go for 10. But usually for us, it is recommended that you should do 50, 50 times Surah Kul Allahu Ahad. So you finish that namaz and then you have Dua Arafat which is presented by Imam Hussain alayhi salam. And his ziyarat. Now you see, we are told that when you go to Karbala, there are certain very important dates. One is the 15th of Shaban, which are called Maksus, a very important time to be in Karbala. Another one is the time of the 40th, Chahlum. And the third is the day of Arafat. But if you look at all these three, the most important day is the day of Arafat. To be. The most important. Even more important than the 40th, important than 15th of Shaman. This is why one of the reasons we find that the Iranian community from Iran this year who have not gone for Hajj, have gone 
to the harm of Imam Hussein salam. Why? Look at the merit of this harm. When the people in Mecca will finish their Hajj, inshallah, and may Allah accept their Hajj, but when they will finish their Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends angels towards Mecca and says, go and congratulate them for completing their Hajj. But he says to the angels, before you go there, go and congratulate the Zabbars of Imam Hussein alayhi salam first. Why? Because had it not been for him, the existence of Makkah would not have been there. That is why it is so important for us to pray and we pray on this night and we pray tomorrow that Allah gives. If you have not been there, I'm just telling you, you go on this day of Arafat and you enter the haram of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, it is the most spiritual experience that you will ever have to be able to be there on the day of Arafat and to be able to recite the dua that he is reciting on the day of Arafat. You see, if you look at history, history says that duas that were written or said by the Imams were taken some time and this is how they actually read out the duas. But when it came to dua Arafat, Imam Hussein is standing on the land of Arafat and the moment he looked up to him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the entire dua came into his mind and he started to recite instantly because of his love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in which he is explaining to us and thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for every little thing that you have on the human body. We don't recognize we have two eyes, nose, and all these important organs that we have in our body. But if you look at the dua and the way Imam Hussein explains and talks about the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why it's so important that not only do we recite this dua, but we recite this dua in the language that we understand ourselves. Because if you, if you read that dua, and if you understand word by word as you are reading as to what Imam Hussein is saying, it is absolutely phenomenal. There comes a time when he says, what have you lost in life when you have found Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What have you lost? Nothing. But he said, what have you gained when you have lost Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world? Just imagine, losing. He's talking about his connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you look at it really carefully, it is exactly a month from Idul Adha to the day of Ashur. It's 10th of Muharram and this is 10th of Zalhaj. And the entire event of Idul Adha, of Hazrat Ibrahim and his relationship with Allah and the tests and sacrifice that he has to give parallels. But the reality happens in Karbala. Therefore, it is so important. That is why the day of Arafat is important. And when, and those of you who have been there, sometimes when I think back, even though I've been there several times, sometimes I think back and I think, did I do this? Did I do this? Did I miss this? Because it always happens that you have gone to Hajj, and you prepare yourself and you're there and people will tell you do this do this you follow and everything and then when you come back and you refer to it a year later you wonder did you ever do that or did you just forget but look at it the second thing that is why Arafat is important is because in Dua Nudba 
We are saying to our 12th Imam, O oh, Imam, where are you? We are asking him, where are you? But one place he is assured that he is there is on the day of Arafat. In fact, it is said that he owns, he has a house in the city of Medina. But it is said that that is the place that you will never miss him. But the problem with us, the scholars say, is that you won't recognize until the day you, inshallah, will see him. And when you will see him, you say, I definitely remember seeing him. Somewhere I have seen because this face is very familiar. And you do not realize that he went right in front of you. But he's there. That is why it's so important that Allah gives us this opportunity. Because that's one place. And look at all the amals, all the prayers that we do. In none of those prayers Allah says, come and visit me. But he says in Hajj, I want you to come. I want you to do the same thing Ibrahim and his family did. I want you to do step by step exactly what they did there. And he has made it mandatory on us if we can afford to do that. But this is what it is. So if you see that, and what happens, there are some mustahabats that we do. And there are some very special reasons why we do what we do. It isn't only about going there and performing the rituals, but it is what performing why do we do that and why does it apply to me when I go back home? How does it apply? How does Hajj apply to me when I go back home? Who am I supposed to be? But you see, you can miss Mina. If you got sick for whatever reason, you can miss all the acts of Hajj for whatever reason if you got sick. But Arafat, you cannot miss. That's why it's called Hajjul Arafat. Because if you miss Arafat for whatever reason, and you could not go onto the land of Arafat, and you know, it happens to many people. If Allah doesn't want you there, you are there. I've seen many people, we had to pick them up and put them back on the plane and send them back home. But Allah knows why. But if that Arafat is not done, your Hajj is not there. You have to go back again to perform your Hajj. Therefore, that Hajjul Arafat is important. Arafat is important. That is where you see. So what do we do? Well, we do the Ahram. And we put on our ihram in highly recommended to do that inside Mecca. But we can't because of the numbers of people. It becomes very difficult. So we are told that, okay, if you cannot do it here, do it in Hijra Ismail. If you cannot do there, then do it on the land of Arafat. So you wear your ihram, but you do your niyyah there. Or you can do your niyyah in the haram. You have your ihram and you do your niyyah. But when you are in Arafat, at that time you are told that now sit down in the evening hours because you have to be there on the day of Arafat. So you go get there in the evening. But when you are there, you are told to do some acts. And they are very meaningful acts. One of the things that we are told to do is write down on a piece of paper as you sit in Arafat. You are to write down what are the sins that you have committed. Small Enlarge, but all the sins. Sit down and write it. Why? Why has Allah done that? That on the day of Arafat, He's asking us, me and you, write down your sins here. Write it down. Put it down on a piece of paper. He says, put it down and write it down. Why? Because Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says 
that the sins that you remember and as humans we can only remember a few you find there was a person who came to Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam two people came to him and they were asking as to how can we seek forgiveness for our sins and Imam alayhi salam gave him a very good example Imam says both of you go onto the desert and pick up big stones and small pebbles pick it up and bring it to me so they both went to there they picked it up they brought it down Imam then told them that I want you to go and place them back to where you brought it from they said well if it's the bigger ones we remember because I know exactly where I got that big stone so I can go and return it but the pebbles I don't know Imam alayhi salam said the biggest sin a human being commits is considering a sin small because he will not be able to account for it and therefore you are told on that day that write down all your sins and put that paper and bury it on the land of Arafat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the day you bury those sins there those are the sins that you will not be accountable on the day of judgment <laughs> see how beautiful it is that is why he wants us to be there he wants us to make every effort to be there because he wants to bring us back to him in the way he had sent us onto this earth he wants to bring us back in complete purity and this is why it is said and look at it that a person who comes from Hajj for four months Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the angels do not write down his misgivings or the small sins that he commits because he has come back as pure as he was from the womb of his mother that is why it is so important and you do that because it reminds me and you that when we go into our cover each of us the angels will ask us about the sins and say write it down they will tell us write it down and we will say we don't have a pen and the angel will say you have a finger use that finger We'll say we don't have a paper. He says you have a coffin. Take a piece of coffin and write down your sins. Because in Surah Isra, in the Holy Quran, we are told that on the day of judgment, each one of us will stand up or rise with a thing that is hanging on our neck. It's a rolled over coffin in which we have put down the sins that we have committed. But if I have done what I have done there, it will not remind me of the sins that I committed prior to that Hajj time. I will only do what I know at that time. Because I have already buried the sins there. But burying the sin means that when I am coming back, I don't commit the sins that I already buried there. And for that, Imam Zainul Abidin salam says <clears throat> that we go to Mina or it is called a place of mash'ur where we go and pick up the pebbles and look at the wisdom behind it we pick up not rocks we pick up pebbles we are told small pebbles we pick up 70 of them but we are supposed to hit each shaitan seven seven times for 21 we pick up 70 why because in case we miss it but we are told that bring those pebbles and why small pebbles because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that shaitan is extremely weak you don't need a rock to hit him he is so weak 
He overpowers you and he shows you that I'm very strong, but he's very weak. You have my name and he cannot come anywhere close to you. But he says we take the small, small pebbles. Today, the place where we go to hit shaitan, there are three shaitans there. Right? Small, middle, and large. Because each of these shaitan, the shaitan was one, but he came in different forms in front of Hazrat Ibrahim. So we are doing the same thing there. So what happens is that we go and hit that shaitan. The amazing thing is, now you don't see that. But if you were there 10 years ago, the, they were pillars. They were not walls. Today they have put up a big wall. So you don't see anybody on the other side. But when, in early days, they used to have pillars. When you hit that stone, no matter where you are, because you, you wonder, right? Thousands and thousands of people are there. And they are hitting the stone at the same time, the pillar. But the beauty is that your stone, you will be able to focus exactly when it will hit that pillar. Among all those thousands of stones going, you will be able to see your own stone going all the way down and hitting that. And seven times it's supposed to. Now, it is small also because on the other side there are people. If you miss that pillar, you'll hit on somebody's head. And everybody gets one. When we, when we used to be there, there was always a return. Reciprocal, you know, they would hit and suddenly it could hit you. But unfortunately, some people bring big, big rocks. Because they say, I want to get rid of that shaitan. But then I say to many of the people, I say, why do you become a shaitan? If you, big, if you bring a bigger rock, you are a burden on everybody there. And you are trying very hard to hit that thing. It's not going to get there. Or they will put an American flag there. Or they will take out their shoes. Oh, there's all kinds of drama going on. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that what you do is what I have asked you to do is just take those pebbles and use those pebbles because shaitan is very weak. And Imam alayhi salam said that when you are picking up that pebble, realize that you are picking up a good deed and leaving behind the sin that you have committed. But you do that and you gather all those pebbles and you hit the shaitan and you finish that part of it and now you are getting to go to Mina. But as you are entering and as you are going to Mina, now Imam Ali Salam says, and there is a debate of a companion called Shibli with Imam Ali Salam. It's a very good debate that takes place between Imam, where Imam is instructing Shibli, what is every act that he performs on the day of Hajj? And he explains it to him. What, do you, what should you be even thinking when you are there? But he says that as you come into Mina, now you are coming into a place where <clears throat> Imam salam says, make one commitment that you will never harm any human being with your hand or your mouth. That is when you have become a pure person. You come out of that mina thing saying that you do not harm anybody, no human being, either with your hand or with your mouth. And this is how the beauty of Hajj is that it lets us understand who we are. It is to recognize who am I. You see, <clears throat> when you ask a child, the child recognizes himself. Why? Because the inside of the child and the exterior of the child is one. It's in sync. When he laughs, he laughs inside <coughs> and exterior. This is how honest children are. But as we grow up, we become two different people. Inside, I'm a different person. Exterior, I'm a different person. 
I may shake hands with you to show that I am with you. But in my heart, I will say, I hate this person. That means that my heart and who I am within and who I am outside is not in sync. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when you are in Arafat, you're trying to recognize yourself and realize yourself and put the entire yourself inside and outside, put it in sync and you become an honest, respectable human being. That is so important for us. That is why one of the things that we do is shaking hands after namaz. Because we've accomplished an act that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked us. But why do we do that? We shake hands at that moment Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the angels that make sure that the sins of those two people who shook hands are removed completely. That is why we shake hands. We do this musafa. And that is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept a system for a human being in such a way and how fortunate we are that Imam alayhi salam, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, if you look at it, he leaves at the time when people were coming for Hajj. He leaves Makkah. He changes his niyyah and finishes it as an Umrah. Why? Because he did not want to spill the blood on the most sacred land of Holy Kaaba. Imam, in order to find out what is the situation in Kufa, and because the letters were coming, and as the letters were coming, he was reading, it is said that he received 18,000 letters from Kufa. And you know what? Have you ever asked yourself, where are those letters today? But remember, this was Imam Hussein. <laughs> he wanted to protect the integrity of every individual that had called him towards Kufa. <laughs> what did he do? He said that before he took his son, Ali Aslam, he went and buried all the letters because he said, I don't want to expose anybody for what they did. <laughs> but this was Imam Hussein Ali Salam. <laughs> that as he saw those letters and he read those letters <laughs> and he said to Muslim in the Aqi, O oh Muslim, <laughs> I'm asking you to visit Kufa on our behalf. Go and find out what is the situation in Kufa. And do these people really mean what they were saying? How do the Muslim leaves with his two sons, Ibrahim and Muhammad? He leaves and he comes into Kufa. He's received so well to the extent that when he went to lead the prayers, Thousands of people were standing behind him. <laughs> but then suddenly the atmosphere changed. It is said to the extent that there was a man called Sharik. He had, he was a friend of Ahlul Bayt. <coughs> On the day of Arafah, he wasn't feeling well. So he was in the home of Hani ibn Urwa. At that moment he tells Muslim that, you know Muslim, Obedullah ibn Ziyad is coming. He's going to come and see me here. This is the best time to get rid of him, kill him. And Muslim ibn Abil said, no, I don't do any act without asking my master. I will not assassinate anyone from behind. <laughs> but this is the way they were brought up. And Hazrat Muslim at that point 
<laughs> then suddenly realizes that everybody had left him. <laughs> he was all alone in the city of Kufa. <laughs> Muslims started like a refugee. <laughs> Did not have a house, had nothing. Everybody had asked him to leave. <laughs> and Muslim was walking on in the neighborhood. <laughs> And he's, there was a lady called Tawa. So Tawa said to Muslim, why don't you come into my house? <laughs> and he enters the house, my brothers and sisters in Islam, when Tawa's husband came back, <laughs> or the son, they realized that Obedullah ibn Ziyad is looking for the man who happens to be in my house. So he goes and complains about him. <laughs> Ubedullah ibn Ziyad sent an army and there was a fight, a fierce fight there outside of Tawa's house. <laughs> but then a time came, they could not control Muslim and realize <laughs> that we will lose the war. They decided to dig a trench and say, put the leaves on top of it as a Muslim would come near <laughs> he would fall into the trench <laughs> and that's exactly what happened when Muslim fell into the trenches just imagine about his two sons <laughs> how difficult it must have been for those two sons of Muslim <laughs> who were in the prison of Kufa wondering what is happening to my father. <laughs> when Muslim was taken and chained into Darul Ammara, <laughs> after a brief conversation with Omedullah ibn Ziyad, they, they took him on the roof <laughs> of Darul Ammara. But before they did anything, Muslim turned towards Makkah and said, As-salamu alayk, Ya Aba Abdullah. It is said that as Imam was starting his journey, Abbas asked Imam and he said, Oh my Imam, why did you reply to a salam? <laughs> and Imam said, Muslim just conveyed me the salam. <coughs> at that moment, at that moment, Abbas said, when is Muslim going through difficulty, he said, yeah. They have taken him on top of a roof of Darul Ammara. <laughs> At that moment, Imam Hussain said, Abbas, come here. <laughs> Look between my two fingers, I will show you what is happening to Muslim in Be'aqeel. <laughs> As Muslim was taken on the roof at that moment, they hit the sword on the neck of Muslim and Muslim's head and the body fell from the roof. <laughs> at that moment, Imam said, Abba, look at that lady who is wearing a veil. She has the head of Muslim in her inside the hijab. Look at the way she's protecting. Do you know who that woman is? <laughs> Abbas said, No, I do not know. Imam said, Oh, Abbas, that is Fatima to Zahra. <laughs> After that event, Imam called Hazrat Muslim's daughter Atika <laughs> and he kept his hand on top of her head 
<laughs> the little girl looked at him <laughs> and said, Aka, the only child on whose head somebody places a hand is an orphan. <laughs> and Imam said, Atika, I'm sorry, but you have lost your father. At that moment, Sakina tells Atika, Atika, do not worry, my father is there. He will look after you. Sakina must have remembered Imam on the night of Shabbatariya. <laughs> <laughs> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم بحق محمد وانت المحمود بحق علي وانت العلا بحق فاطمة وانت فاطر السماوات والأرض بحق الحسن وانت المحسين بحق الحسين وانت قديم الأحسان إلهي طوبة قبل الموت وراحة عند الموت ومغفرة بعد الموت والنجاة من النار ودخولا في الجنة وافية من كل بلاء الدنيا وغاب الآخرة ما تمهوسين